Welcome. Uh, excited that you guys could join us this evening for our Tech Tuesday uh, webinar on air trajectory. And um, I'm uh, Dr. John Lohr. I'm with the National Office, and I work on the program and do professional development and kind of training and workshops like these. Um, and joining me is our air trajectory expert, uh, Jeremy Gerber, who comes to us um, from uh, Northridge as not only a longtime Science Olympiad coach, but he's been an event supervisor and trainer and really knows this uh, event inside and out. So he's excited that he was able to join us to answer your questions. Um, if you could, uh, while we're getting going here, put your name and you know your school or your team and the state in the chat, it would be greatly appreciated. And while you do that, I'm gonna see if I can launch this poll if it works right, right? I'd like you to tell me uh, if you could pick any ball to be dropped from the top of the Empire State Building on New Year's Eve, which of these balls would you like to see dropped? Anybody else? Right, we'll go ahead and end it and share the results. Looks like um, results-wise, soccer ball was the, the most popular. So going for the, uh, the big, nicely visible one. But uh, I give a lot of credit to the guys with the ping pong ball or the people that selected ping pong ball and golf ball because uh, I appreciate your interest in seeing what would happen with the elasticity from uh, that height and um, what could come of it. So thank you guys very much for uh, participating and giving us some insights. So just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the way this session is going to work is it's being recorded. So if you got to leave early or you're trying to take notes and you miss something, don't worry about it. We're going to send you the link. Um, so you can listen to it um, again and again, should you need to. Um, but also, uh, and that'll happen sometime in the next couple of days. Um, but the other thing uh, I want to tell you is that this session and the way we're trying to think of uh, Tech Tuesdays and Thinking Thursdays are really about trying to get um, you help and get your questions answered. So if you have specific questions about technical things with the event, so how to do something, um, trying to, you're trying to troubleshoot a problem and you haven't been able to quite figure out what's going on, feel free to put that in either the Q&A or the chat and uh, we'll get uh, Jeremy to talk about it and see if we can't get you some help and get you on the right track. And we're going to try and get to as many of the questions as we can. All right, so on that note, I will throw it out there and give you a second to throw questions in either the chat or the Q&A. Okay, let's and give everybody a second while we're waiting on that. Jeremy, let me ask you, one of the things that I know has come up and the rules say the the whatever ball you're using, whether it's a ping pong ball, racquetball, tennis ball, it has to be unmodified, right? Now, can I, since I'm providing them, could I write um, St. Rita High School on ours so we don't, you know, lose the tennis balls we bring to a tournament, or would that no longer be unmodified? Right. So the rules allow for you to. Uh do a basic marking of the projectile to label them as yours. Obviously, the bigger the competition you go to, the more balls there's going to be rolling around. I know I've already done several this year, and you're trying to keep ping pong balls. Whose ping pong ball is whose? Um, no, you're allowed to do a basic marking. Um, so, you know, taking like a Sharpie and writing your school name on the ball is uh, 
perfectly legal. Um, you just want to make sure that the, you know, the marking that you're doing is not a deliberate attempt to, to try to add weight. Um, I had a team uh, for trajectory. Uh, we had a similar rule. They came in with a racket ball that literally they took masking tape and just wrapped it around it essentially and turned it into like a masking tape ball at that point. Um, you know, obviously that's excessive. You're adding weight to it. You're altering the projectile at that point. So, you know, that would be a problem, but just simply labeling the ball is, is no big deal at all. All right. Um, and thank you guys. We had two questions in. I'm going to throw this one to you. Jeremy came in first here um, from Steven. He asked, he has a fireplace bellow that he wanted to use as kind of his um, pressure vessel. And he wanted to make sure that was legal because his concern is like, since he bought the bellow or he probably took it from, you know, his fireplace tools at the house, he didn't actually build it. Um, no. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, the fireplace bellow in theory would be fine. Um, you know, the expectation is for the most part, the, uh, air pressure chamber, if you will, is probably not going to be homemade for most groups, right? So you're looking at like, you know, one of the common things is an empty two liter bottle. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, red rubber balls that have been converted to use. Um, so those are all okay. The big thing is it just needs to um, be an ambient pressure. Um, and most fireplace billows that I'm aware of are um, they don't have stored pressure in them. So no, I've, and I've seen been a few years, but I've seen uh, bellows uh, successfully used before in this event. Um, kind of a little less common thing to see um, just because they're getting harder to come by, but yeah, that definitely be okay. All right. Um, and then uh, so, and I apologize, Sonia, I believe if I hope I, didn't butcher that name too much um has a question about he it's written i i need a way to release pressurized air from the chamber into a tube but they're not able to use like a pressure release valve so that's tricky um there are different check valves that i've seen successfully used for this um, that are rated to open up at a given pressure. Um, kind of tough just by the nature of this because a lot of those are designed more for liquids than they are gases. And so a gas uh, pressure relief valve usually is a fairly high pressure thing. Um, what I would probably say is instead of necessarily worrying about getting an exact pressure, um, one of the things that I like, if you're storing the pressure, so obviously this has to start at ambient pressure. You're going to drop your weight. I'm assuming there's going to be some pressurization, and then you want to release it. Um, I suggest instead of worrying about a pressure release valve, uh, having a secondary string attached to your weight. So your weight doesn't get all the way to the ground. Instead, right before it bottoms out, that string opens a release valve on the device. So you're building up pressure with the drop. And then once it gets to a point, a second line that's connected to the weight near the bottom of the drop will trigger and let the release go. Um, butterfly valves, um, you know, work well for that. Uh, I've seen a lot of success with that because a butterfly valve, once it triggers, it tends to open up and let everything out at once. Um, in terms of trying to get a very accurate pressure release valve at the low pressures we're working at is extremely difficult. And I don't know that it's necessary uh, for this. So long as you're getting somewhat consistent pressure, you ought to be able to dial in your range uh, with the angle of your barrel um, instead. Okay. Um, this one shows up in the chat and it's from Daruv, I believe. Um, uh, I hit and it's just, the description is I have a drop tower and piston design. Um, but even when he changes the diameter of the drop tower, say from four to six inches, it doesn't cause the ping pong ball to go further. 
and it's trying to understand the relationship there between the the diameter and and how to get better distance for the ping pong ball. So if I had to guess, um, I'd say you probably got one of two things going on here. One is even though you went from four to six inches, um, perhaps your seal around the piston itself is not outstanding. And so if you're leaking air out the sides of the piston, uh, going up in diameter isn't going to get you much. Uh, the other thing is if you're having difficulty getting the ping pong ball to go, if you feel like you've got a good seal around the piston, what I suggest is looking at a larger diameter hose uh, running to your barrel. Um, what I have found in the about nine times out of 10, the issue, if it's not, that, if it's, if it's that you've got good seal around the piston, what you probably need is a bigger diameter going from the piston chamber to the barrel itself. A lot of times, uh, you know, people use like the little quarter inch hose and you're not getting enough air through to really launch the ball out of the barrel. And so that's what I would encourage looking at first. That tends to be with the piston design, at least my experience have been, that's been the two biggest problems. One is not quite a good enough seal around the piston itself. Um, and then the secondary one being not a big enough tube running from the piston chamber itself to the barrel itself. If you've got a six inch piston, you should be launching that ping pong ball you know, tremendously, um, given the volume of air you should be moving. Um, so that would be what I would think. Okay. Because the big idea behind it is you, to get distance, you want a big volume of air kind of hitting that ping pong ball as much at the same time as you can, right? Like right. Right. All right, so, so change the converter drop, the drop tower to the shooting PVC. Yes, that would be what I would recommend is looking there. That's probably your problem. If you feel like you've got a good seal around the piston, that is probably your issue into why you're not going real far. Your other thing would maybe be if that doesn't work, if your barrel is maybe six inches or less, try a longer barrel would be another thing to consider. All right. Um, jumping over to the um, Q&A, we have a question in here asking about um, kind of their prep and like what materials they're allowed to have with them. So right. the first one comes in and asks, is, can they use an electronic uh, angle reader to measure the angle of the launch pipe? Sure, but it can't be permanently fixed in the device. Remember, any of your electronic devices have to be removable for this event. And so you have to be sure that you uh, make it removable. Um, with my own kids, when I'm teaching them, if they're using anything electrical, whether it be an electronic angle reader or a laser for aiming, um, you want to make sure that you have built-in mounts, if you will, that the device goes on and then comes off easily, right? Your angle reader isn't going to do you a lot of good if you're not putting it on the same part of the barrel every time. And so I would make sure that you're, you know, you have some way of knowing that your angle reader is being mounted to the same part every time. Beyond that, just remember it does have to be removable. Um, if you find that you are you and your partner are forgetful um, and you tend to forget when you get nervous, um, it may be best to just do something analog like a big protractor instead. Um, so that's something to be to consider. Um, I see the next question we got in that line is, can teams bring in calculations and use them if they forgot to impound them? Um, for anything that I'm running this year, the answer is going to be no. Um, all of the calculations and all of the paper has to be impounded, and that is for the competitor's own good. Uh, one issue that I've seen over and over again is, you know, we announce at the end of impound what the distances are. Um, 
I don't want, uh, I don't, I want the kids to be the ones to figure these things out. And so I feel like I've seen too many times where either parents or coaches have handed the kids pre-worked out calculations. Um, I want the kids using the calculations that they've already done. So no, that, that will not be okay. Um, with regards to what materials can we use to build this year, um, really almost, you know, anything within reason. If we're, if, if we're being realistic, there's not uh, too many uh, caveats in terms of what you can't use. Um, most common material we'll see is wood. Um, we obviously see a lot of PVC pipe during the course of the season. Um, those are both very, uh, both, you know, relatively inexpensive building materials, and they're both fairly commonly used. Um, you're going to have some kind of plumbing in there to use as your barrel. And to be honest, we're working at such low pressure, I see no advantage to like using metal pipe. Um, but I've had groups before where um, they came in and dad was a plumber and dad had a bunch of old cast iron pipe laying in the garage. And so they built their entire device out of old cast iron plumbing. Um, there's nothing in the rules against that. And to be honest, you know, it was a heavier machine, so it, it didn't move when it shot. That much was for sure. Yeah, I'd imagine that would the whole cast iron uh, air can in there would stay in, in one place. Pretty yeah, it did not wiggle much, and it definitely took both partners to uh, move it. Um, all right, back here in the chat, it's asking you about launch mechanisms and your opinion on a drop tower uh, versus a beach ball. I'll be... I'll be real honest with you with regards to the launch mechanism itself. Um, I feel like with this year's rules in particular, um, we've been very generous in terms of dimensions. Um, both both uh, B and C uh, get a fairly large footprint to work in. Um, we've also been very generous with regards to the amount of counterweight that we've given teams to work with. Uh, to me, uh, this year's rules, the challenge isn't really how you're going to shoot it, right? Um, you know, I've seen very successful drop tower mechanism devices. I've seen very successful where they use, you know, the beach ball or they use the, you know, you know, whatever. Um, I've had devices this year that just simply this that I've seen this year that simply just use a two liter that they're hitting with a large amount of weight. So I guess what I'm getting at here is I don't know that I would get wrapped up too much with how you're shooting it. Um, so long as you put some time in the design, getting your uh, minimum distance um, isn't a thing. What you want to work on, I would encourage just getting done early um, to practice with it to be real honest, in terms of which do I think would be more accurate or precise. That's tough. I've seen both with a high degree of precision. Um, I feel like the, the precision and how teams do is more a function of who has shot their device the most as opposed to any given method. Um, this is an event that you're going to do very well in if you practice quite a bit with your device. Um, and I feel like that's more important than uh, maybe the, the method that you use. Um, the other thing that I would say is, you know, for me personally, um, I would try to build a device of the projectile options that you have this year. Uh, my favorite is the racquetball. Um, reason being is it's a little bit heavier projectile. Um, that makes it more challenging to get it go to get it to go the long range, but it's also the one that tends to be less disturbed by air currents in the room. Um, you know, it's it's fairly you know it's it's a pretty simple task, especially with the counterweight that we gave the middle school and the dimensions that we gave the middle school pretty easy task to get a ping pong ball to go eight meters. Um, but 
dialing in that ping pong ball can be quite a bit trickier because it is a fairly lightweight projectile. Um, it can be disturbed by, you know, air currents in the room and that can shift it just a little bit. Um, now, how much of a difference will that make? You know, that, that's hard to say. It depends on the level of competition at the place you're going. Um, but in terms of consistency, my experience has been the racquetball tends to be the most consistent of the projectiles that you shoot. And so what I encourage, you know, if you can, is to build a device that can shoot that racquetball. You can still win with ping pong balls. Um, I've, you know, even at a high level. Um, but in terms of making your life easier, in terms of dialing it in, um, the racquetball tends to be the easier of the ones uh, to dial in. At least that's been my experience of the projectile options we're giving you this year. Um, <clears throat> hey, speaking of the the mechanism and stuff, and kind of the the launching piece, there we'd seen a couple of questions coming through. FAQs, and I know it was a concern about um, when you guys were first talking about the rules, um, you know, several months ago, of like the distance and how the how the device itself is triggered. Could you kind of just talk about that setup a little bit and remind kids well, what they need to yeah. pay attention to? The big thing to remember, and the couple invitationals that I've ran early on, I've been uh, pretty forgiving. But remember, when you go to shoot, your entire body has to be behind that 75 centimeter line that we trace around uh, the one and a half meter by one and a half meter box that your device is in. And so that means you can't be leaning over a bunch over that line. It means your whole body has to be uh, behind that line. Uh, one issue that I've seen too is kids you know, a lot of kids will use some kind of a pull string uh, to trigger their device, which is perfectly okay. Just make sure you're tying enough cord to it. Um, you know, you may have to shift your device. You know, I've seen where kids build a device where they pull it to launch, but let's say they always have to pull from the left side of their device, which is fine. That's that's not a not a big deal, but with regards to that, you know, if you find that you want to put your device at a competition all the way to the right inside the box, you need to make sure you have enough lines so that you can be standing behind the left side with your device all the way over to the right. Um, I guess what I'd say is just don't be stingy with your trigger cord if you're using a cord. Another thing I've seen a lot of, which again is perfectly okay, is teams will have like a long stick and they use that to trip a trigger, perfectly legal. I'm not a big fan of them myself because uh, I've seen where kids have gotten nervous and they tip their device over with them. Um, but just remember, just make sure your stick is big enough <laughs> if you're going to go the big stick route. A simple meter stick is not going to be long enough. Um, it, it just you won't have enough reach. You know, you're probably looking at needing probably at least two meters worth of stick. Uh, to be able to trigger your device from anywhere uh, within that. I uh, see I got a question in terms of what design does your team use? Not to get too specific because my kids would would uh, yell at me. Um, my younger kids tend to use the dropping the weight onto some type of pressure vessel, just the simple weight smacking the two liter bottle. My older kids... Uh, just because they are tougher to build, uh, use the piston design, where they have the piston that falls through the, the tube. Um, again, I've had where my younger kids already this year beat my older kids in competition, so I don't really see where either of those designs are, you know, where one design is better than another. Um, but, you know... That's what we use. Uh, I've got kids that kind of use both. Uh, question, are we supposed to get two practice shots? Could you elaborate on how those goes? Uh, the answer is you don't get any practice shots. Um, the practice shots are supposed to happen before you uh, get to the competition. 
Um, there's no practice shots at competition. You get two shots at each target, and those are both competition shots. So when your team comes to the competition and it's your time to go, uh, we will tell you that you have eight minutes to get your four shots off, and you get two shots at the near target and two shots at the far target. Um, you tell us which one you're shooting at. Um, you'll take your shot. We'll stop the time. We'll take a measurement. We'll give you your ball back. We'll restart time. You get your device ready. You tell us which one you're shooting at. And we do that until you get your four shots done. Now, the other thing to remember is if we are within a half meter of your um, near target or the far target on your first shot, you can opt to take a bucket shot instead of um, your second shot at the target. And so that's that's another another thing there. You can take bucket shots. Uh, can I adjust the position of my device to hit the far target if it doesn't fit inside the smaller square, but it does in the bigger one? Not really sure what you're getting at there. Um, your device always has to fit that footprint, okay? And your device always has to be within the one and one and a half meter by one and a half meter box when you're shooting. And so you don't, yeah, you don't get to, to move outside of that dimension when you're shooting. Um, we've done about a hundred practice shots and charted the data to make the graphs, but we don't really have an equation yet that says at X height and Y angle, the ball will go this far. Any tips on how to get a good equation from all your practice? You know, I would graph it out, see if you, what kind of a relationship you have. Um, I have found that these generally aren't linear. And so that makes it tricky to get an equation of a line, if you will, if you don't have that linear relationship. And so I don't know that I would force it to get an equation. You know roughly the distances that you're going to be asked to shoot. Um, you know, it's not like there's a big range here, at least not until you get to the national tournament in terms of where we can position things. So early on, I would just focus on, you know, where, where we can go, you know, the half meter increments. And then for the further targets, we can go up to the, up to two meters to the right or two meters to the left. Um, but in terms of getting a good equation, I have found over the years that most devices do not lend themselves to a real nice, neat equation um, that, that gives you that. Um, I think it's more of a, you look at your data tables, you look at the graph that it was created, and from there, you figure out how to position things. Plus, the other thing is what I tell kids a lot of times and what I tell my own kids that I coach is, is rarely do you win Science Olympiad throwing events on the first shot, right? It's not the first shot that wins these type of things for you. It's how do you adjust to get it closer on the second shot, right? Um, that's, that's really the key. Can you adjust your device to do better on the second shot? Um, and that's, that's the question that you need to be able to answer and need to be able to do. So, Jeremy, you're really thinking about when you coach your teams and advise others, they given, they're given four shots. The first shot is almost a ranging get close shot to really help you dial in that second shot on each target. So they really want to make sure they're able to shoot four, four times in that time span. Right, right. So one of the things that I would advise early on just to get used to eight minutes is when you're practicing at, at your school, you know, have a coach put down uh, – a track and it doesn't have to be elaborate just put some tape dots on the floor for you to practice with set a timer and get used to what eight minutes is um, get used to moving with kind of that controlled sense of urgency eight minutes is actually quite a bit of time so long as you keep moving 
Um, and so that's that's the big thing that I would encourage. Um, once you've got some data, you know, the person that just you know mentioned, they're like, you know, we've got over 100 data points already. At that point, how you want to start practicing is you want to start practicing getting two shots off at two different targets in less than eight minutes. Um, that's that's what you want to start practicing now. Um, and if you find that you have a hard time getting four shots off in eight minutes, you need to start look, thinking about what you need to do to your design to get it so that you can. Because if you're having a hard time getting four shots off in eight minutes at home, you're going to have a really hard time getting four shots off in eight minutes uh, at a competition. And so I would strongly encourage that. Get a sense of what eight minutes are. Get one of your teammates that isn't necessarily doing something at a practice to run a stopwatch um, on you so you get used to doing it. Uh, I've seen teams that have had just amazingly elaborate aiming systems, for instance, but it took them close to five minutes to get the first shot off. Was it really close on that first target? Yep. But now you have three minutes to get a shot on the other target to even have one shot on each. And so you got to get used to moving quicker. Let's see, we've added a laser that fits onto a removable device onto our shooting arm for our device, which is a piston air chamber, but we can't get the angle right so that it's predicting where our ball will hit. It seems like we'd have to adjust the laser pointer precisely for each hit. Our laser pointers more trouble than they are worth, in your opinion? Are we missing something obvious? In my opinion, laser pointers are good for one thing and one thing only, and that is your left to right. Um, in terms of helping you uh, precisely determine range, um, I just, I, I haven't had much luck with them being helpful with that, even the ones that have the laser tapes here of late. Um, they, they can be useful for left to right. Um, and that's about it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to say that lasers, I feel, I feel like lasers ultimately are good, like I said, to help you with your left to right motion, but they're really good in my opinion, uh, at competitions themselves. And what I mean by that is, so if you take a precise measurement and you line it up and you take a shot and you're off some amount left to right. I find using a laser tool then can better help you determine what you need to do to sh dial it in on that second shot. For instance, let's say you have data and you send your partner down range and you put a post up and according to your data, you got it to school, the laser should be, you know, five inches to the left or whatever. You take your shot and it lands two inches to the right of center. So let's say your front and back are very good. You're just off, say, two, three inches right of center. You know that when you lined up, you were five inches to the left. So what you do is you shift at that two to three this way more to pull it more this way to line up. So you can adjust your aim based on the data that you got. I do like, uh, I do like lasers for that. I think they're more useful in competition, though, than they are in practice, um, has been my experience. Um, especially since, you know, when you're going to a competition, you don't know how drafty the gym's going to be. Um, it can be just very different conditions from where you're practicing at school. So having that laser can help you adjust in competition. For the pressure taper is designed, do I need a valve to build up pressure? I don't think so. I know that's been a real popular thing in the past is to just really build up a lot of pressure as it drops and then let it all go. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. You only have to be able to shoot a little bit more than eight meters. You know, the longest target I can theoretically give you kids is eight meters down range and then either two meters to the right or two meters to a left, which comes out to be something like 8.2 or 8.3 meters total is the longest range I could possibly give you. 
I don't see where there would be any real need to build up a bunch of pressure and release it. Um, not to mention that that can, you know, it, to me, any device that I've seen that tries to build up a fair amount of pressure seems to have consistency problems because given the constraints that we put in the event, it's hard to consistently build up the same pressure every time. So in my opinion, the amount of time that you would spend developing that method isn't worth it. You should spend more time practicing, taking measurements, things of that nature. Drop height. If you have the, if you really dial in where the mass hits, if you dial in, you know, you're going to be close enough. Um, if you put the ball the same distance within the barrel, basically, if you take as many measurements as you can, you're going to find that you can be fairly consistent. I don't, none of my kids measure pressure directly. Um, they measure how far down they put the projectile in the barrel, barrel angle, uh, height of the mass, position of the pressure vessel they're striking. Uh, for the piston design, elevation of the piston upon release. Um, are you going to have the same pressure every single time? Probably not, but it's going to be within tolerance that you're not going to notice a tremendous distance in your launches, or at least you shouldn't. If you're setting up your device the same way every time and you don't have a lot of consistency, I would start looking for air leaks in your design because odds are good you're losing air somewhere and that's what's causing some of your consistency issues. Yeah, from everything we've seen and heard from others, it's if you're if you're finding problems with your pressure, it's usually because you have a leak somewhere in your your system, or as Jeremy talked about earlier, maybe you're not delivering the air as quickly as you think because of hose diameter or hose length, that kind of thing. Um, hey, Jeremy, while we wait to see if anyone else has from the group, we had a question that came in, I think it was probably, or at least the answer just went out today, about what a launch is could you kind of walk everybody through what counts as a launch what doesn't count as a launch that kind of thing so basically if you pull your trigger and nothing happens that will not count as a launch um, but if your device starts to go through the firing motion so if your counterweight drop things of that nature at that point, it's going to count as one of your launches. And so the big thing that I tell my kids to do, I would tell you to do this, is you want both partners to look down the barrel to make sure the ball's in the barrel. Okay. Um, that, that tends to be the, uh, unfortunately, that tends to be the most common uh, failed launch is that the, uh, ball was never in the barrel. Now, I will say early on the invitationals that I've done, I uh, have not been real strict on that. I'll let kids put the ping pong ball in. Uh, however, you know, you get to a state tournament, you get to the national tournament, you're going to need to make sure that you are definitely loading your ball uh, into the barrel of your launcher. And so that's, like I said, that's one of the things that uh, I require my kids that both of them, even though it still feels silly, maybe looking down the barrel, both need to look down the barrel to make sure it's there. But there are times, you know, I've seen where kids build safeties in to make sure their mask doesn't fall early. They pull the trigger. They forgot to take the safety off. Nothing happens. Uh, we're not going to count that as a launch. So you'll be able to reset it and take your safety off and pull the trigger. Um. And before we get to these last two long ones that popped in, another one that has been kind of a common question coming to the national office has been about changing the weight. So assuming like I have a particular weight we're using to get us to the near target, and then I'm gonna we want to muscle up and I want to add weight to get to the the far target. Could you talk about how that's going to like how that should be handled at the tournament? So, and how time works. Yeah. 
So you're only allowed to impound your division's total amount of weight, whether that be three and a half kilograms or five kilograms. Now, um, so that gets checked at the start. What I have said is, and I believe what the clarification uh, is that came out. So if you come in and let's say, for instance, your division B and you have your five kilograms of mass and you want to take mass off of that. Since I've already weighed that, verified that that's five kilograms, if you want to take mass off, obviously that mass is going to weigh less now. I have no problem with that. The issue comes in is if you want to put mass back onto the weight. If you want to add mass back onto your mass at that point, we're going to have to re-weigh the mass. Reason being is, um, you know, that's just to keep it fair. Let's say, you know, the weight you took off was a blue disc and now you want to put the blue disc back on. Uh, I have no way of knowing if, you know, you had a different blue disc in that box that you have tools that you brought in and now all of a sudden you have too much weight. So the process of adding mass back on um, will have to reweigh uh, the mass, and that's just to keep it fair. Again, like I said, we weigh the masses up front. If you're taking mass off, it's obvious that at that point it's going to have less mass uh, than you know the the predetermined amount. But putting mass back on is going to require uh, reweight. Right. Um. So looking at the one and anonymous put in the Q and a talking about an experience they had at invitationals um, because they misunderstood the rules and I wanted their sharing. Um, so I think everyone's aware. So that this particular invitational they were at um, the device has to fit in either a 75 centimeter cube if you're division C or an 85 centimeter cube if you're in division B, but that has to be at all orientations of um, the barrel. Um, they seem to have gotten uh, disqualified or set aside because um, in any orientation but right. 45 degrees, they ended up outside those dimensions. Right. Your device always has to be able to fit inside that dimension. And so you need to make sure, you know, when, when we do measurements, and I don't know that I did this one specifically, but uh, when we do measurements, you know, I want to see the barrel at different angles and kind of the, you know, again, this is device specific, but whatever barrel orientation is going to cause your device to take up the most space. Okay. For some teams, that's straight down. For some teams, that's up like 45. Whatever is going to cause it to have the largest uh, footprint it possibly can, that is the footprint that you're going to have to show me that fits in that dimension, okay? Um, because in theory, you can shoot that barrel at any orientation you want. And so I know that if you, you know, we, we put the barrel where it's going to take up the most room and it fits in dimension, I know that you're not going to have any problem uh, fitting in dimension when you're actually shooting. And so, yes, you got to make sure that, and that's, that's a tricky one, not going to lie. Um, you know, that's why one thing that I would encourage, you know, you want to maximize that drop height because that's energy. And I would never build the dimension because you don't know what kind of meter stick a judge is going to use, right? It might be different, just a little bit different. So never build, you know, right up to 85 centimeters tall or right up to 75 centimeters tall give yourself at least a centimeter or two there you know the, the the highest i would make mine you know if a dimension if the max science olympiad dimension is 75 centimeters the tallest i would make it is 73 but when we get down low really there's no advantage to using all that space and so i would encourage you to try not to uh, if anything it's more advantageous to try to have a smaller footprint because then you can move your device around more inside that one and a half meter by one and a half meter box. Um, having a device with a smaller footprint, it actually makes it easier to move it around inside that box 
and so makes it so you have more adjustability and competition if you have a smaller footprint. The bigger you make that thing, the more of a footprint it has, the more it's space it takes up in that meter and a half by meter and a half, the less room you have to maneuver uh, inside the competition space itself. Okay. Um, we're gonna go with one more question here and it looks like uh, uh, Drew's got it in there asking about, um, they're doing the drop method and they, again, so it's changing the uh, four to six inches. Um, and that they're that the ball is being released before the weight hits. Um, so, you know, you really got two options there um, that I've seen that are the simpler options. Um, one is well, the simplest option is to just have a longer barrel, um, more physical distance for the ball to travel through, um, allows for more of that pressure to build up. Um, so that's that's the easiest fix. Uh, the other fix is to have a secondary chamber that the pressure goes into. And then upon getting to the bottom, your weight also triggers a release uh, for a valve on that secondary chamber. Um, I would try a longer barrel first. Um, but I'm going to be real honest. Um, having a six inch uh, piston, uh, in my opinion... Uh, and my experience is, is probably overkill um, because you just don't have to shoot that far. Um, four inch piston, you should be able to get more than enough horsepower, if you will, to shoot the projectile, uh, the given range that we have. Um, and then you're not control trying to control as much of that. All right, everybody. Um, one, if you would please, thank you uh, to Jeremy for taking the time and doing this tonight. Much appreciated. He's uh, coming off a, a long day of final exams and trying to make it to the, the holiday break. I want to thank all of you guys for doing this and uh, wish you guys a really good um, holiday break and hope all exams and coursework and all that stuff uh, wraps up well, and I hope to see you at a, a Science Olympiad tournament uh, in the spring. Um, pay attention to the website and our social media accounts because we will be doing more of these on some other topics in the new years. But again, thank you very much to Jeremy and have a wonderful break and happy holidays to everybody.